So you would have seen that I have uh, graded your executive summary over the weekend. It was a tedious job, but I was able to do it. Okay. Uh, so I have only one comment, uh, which I have seen over the past several years. So one thing, the good thing is I was very pleased by looking at the executive summary. Almost every one of you have done a very good job of summarizing what you have been doing for the project and what you intend to do in the future. And some of you, of course, have come to me later on and said that you want to change your project, which is completely fine, as long as you have the draft report ready on November 9th or 10th, whatever the deadline is. Okay. The only comment I have is when you write a function, you have to write it as a function. Okay. So for instance, in one of the report, I won't write the exact function, but it was written something like this, f equals a x plus b u. Okay. f is a function. It has to be written as a function. Okay. So f should be written as f of x comma u. Okay, which is saying that x and u are variables, which implicitly means, by the way, that a and b are constants. Okay, and f is a function of x and u, and that's how you represent an equation. Now, some people tend to write an equation of this type, x dot equals to ax plus bu. Okay, x dot is a function of time, so it has to be written as x dot t equals, okay, what of, which of these variables are functions of time, which of them are constant. So you have to write it explicitly. So you have to write it as a x t plus b u t. Okay, that's the right way to write it. So I know that a and b are constants, they don't depend on time, and x, x and u are functions of time, okay, and x dot t is basically written in this format. Because I could also write an equation okay, and you see that there is a difference between what is written here. So this is written as a static problem. So x is a variable, u is a variable, a and b are constants. In this case, x is a function of time a and b are constants. In this case, x is a function of time, a is a function of time, and b is a function of time, and u is a function of time. Okay, so you have to be explicit about this function depends on these, these parameters, and it doesn't depend on something else. And whatever you don't show as a function of time, I'll implicitly assume that they are constants. Okay, so when you are writing a document, a technical report, a paper, you have to explicitly mention what is dependent on time and what is not dependent on time. Okay, it's not a good habit to write f equals ax plus bu. This is not acceptable. Okay, because because what I would assume is f is a variable, a x is a con a is a constant, x is a constant, b is a constant, u is a constant. Therefore, f is a constant. Okay, because it's not written as a function of function of x and u. So. That's what I'm going to assume that f is a constant, whereas it is not. You're really trying to minimize the function subject to some constraint. So please be aware of that and don't confuse me. Okay? So, so, uh, so when you're writing your final report, you should, be, you should write it like this or like this, okay? Not like this. So that's the only comment I have. Uh, and everyone who has submitted, uh, uh, an executive summary has received 10 marks for submitting it on time. Okay, any question about the report? No? Okay, so today we start a very important topic in optimization. It's called duality. And uh, the way I want to motivate the discussion about duality is that so far our assumption has been that x is a subset of rn and f is a function from x to r which is differentiable okay and in many cases that i'm going to talk about you have situations where x is not a subset of rn it's probably x would sit in a discrete space, 0, 1 raised to n, 
okay so this is just binary so each each element of this vector in x would either be 0 or 1 okay so it's a discrete variable and f would be a function from x to r and as you can see if you define this as your space over which you are optimizing uh, you you can't define differentiability there is nothing known as differentiable function over 0 1 raise to n because it's not a continuous space okay so there is no you see if the points look something like this you can't define differentiability because there is no neighborhood of a point defined in the set x so we can't really carry forward whatever we have done so far we can't carry forward those ideas to problems of this type okay so let me start with a very important problem which exhibits this kind of behavior or this kind of formulation is the traveling salesman problem okay and the idea is as follows you have a salesperson who has to visit different cities so let's say one two three four so these are the cities and the salesman has to visit each city only once and has to come back to the original uh, point and he can pick which city he wants to start with so if he starts with two he has to cover one three four and then come back to two so that's his that's his goal and he wants to minimize the cost of traveling from one city to another okay so let's say aij is the cost of going from city i to city j the well, cost of traveling okay and so it has to figure out it will go from 2 to 3, 3 to 4, 4 to 1, 1 to 2. That's one option. The other option is going from 2 to 4, 4 to 3, and 3 to 1, and then 1 to 2, and so on. There are many options that this, this salesman can take. And how should we formulate it as an optimization problem over this kind of space? So let's say I have n cities. And let's say x i j is a variable. It's in zero comma one, and x i j equals to one implies salesman travels from city i to city j okay and this problem was has been studied for a very long time this problem is very important most of the heuristics that you develop for problems of this type they are first tested on the traveling salesman problem because uh, they want to see how good this algorithm performs as compared to other algorithms that have been designed specifically for solving this problem and if you think about it this problem is not uh, it's not a, just an arbitrary theoretical problem. If you think about how USPS, FedEx, Delta, American Airlines, and so on, they work, they're all trying to solve the scheduling problem. In fact, classroom scheduling in the university is a very, very big problem, okay? So more, much bigger problem than you think because those problems are also problems of this type, okay? And, and people have to solve this problem. So instead, what they do is they don't uh, they don't move classes around okay anytime because they know that if they move classes around then they have to figure out which room they have to assign to each class and how the whatever what are the instructor preferences what are the student preferences and so on becomes a huge integer optimization problem and nobody can solve it so they just you know keep the schedule the same so this class for instance optimization has been taught on Monday Wednesday Friday 145 to 2 sorry 150 to 245 pm for the last 10 15 years okay 
So they don't change the 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 um, the class timing at all because it's a huge problem. So here is here is the optimization problem. I want to minimize x i j in zero one summation i equals one to n summation j equals one to n j not equals to i a i j x i j I equals to one to n. Then we want summation greater than or equal to two for every s subset of 1 to n. Okay, so that's the, the problem. It's a constraint. So this is the objective function, constraint one, constraint two, constraint three. Okay, there are three constraints. So this is the objective function, you all understand. This constraint says that I have to visit every city I. So these two constraints essentially mean that from every city I, I have to go to some city J, which is within the set. Okay, and of course j is not equal to i, this summation is over all j from 1 to n, this summation is over all i from 1 to n. Okay, so from every city i you have to go to some city j and this, this uh, constraint is required to ensure that you do not group the cities together and then there is no connection between them. So uh, these two are easy to understand, for this consider this problem where if you did not have this constraint, if you did not have that constraint, a solution would look something like this. Okay, but there is no way to go from 2 to 4 or there is no way to go from 4 to 2. Okay, so if you do not have this constraint, you might get a solution of this type by solving this optimization problem. So you want to avoid doing such things. So you consider a set S, which is a strict proper subset of the, the set of all nodes. And this will be, so this will be I in S, this will be J in, J not in S, okay. And you want, you want at least one link going from i to j and j to i okay so you have to be at least greater than or equal to 2 for this entire sum for every proper subset s which is a subset of 1 to n okay so this is combinatorial number of uh, inequality constraints and then these are n equality constraints and n so 2n inequality constraint and then and, and then this constraint is basically for every possible proper subset. So that's a combinatorial. How many proper subsets are there for 1 to n? So probably that would be n choose 1 plus n choose 2 plus n choose 3 plus all the way n choose n minus 1. 
so so this would be i think okay so my my conjecture is that this is n raised to n minus 1 constraint okay this constraint so this is this is com this is very high number of constraints so if n is equal to 10 this is 10 raised to 10 I, what is 10 raised to 10 10 billion <coughs> okay 10 billion minus 1 no 1 billion no 10 billion minus 1 constraint okay so very high number of constraints so that's the traveling salesman problem and if you think about it if you want to solve this problem using the methods that we have discussed so far which involves you to compute the gradient and go into the direction of negative gradient and so on you can't do it because the gradient is not well defined because the set is a discrete set okay it's not a continuous set so so that's a problem okay we want to so far we know how to solve problems of this type but now we want to come up with algorithms that can solve problems of this type okay and the way to come up with such algorithms is to try and understand what's happening so you want to come up with a geometry of the problem so that you can see the problem clearly okay uh, so that's what we are going to do we are going to come up with an appropriate appropriate lens of looking appropriate lens to look at this problem so that we can solve or we can at least come up with an idea to solve problems of this type efficiently okay in 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 uh, in in as fewer iterations as possible so that's our goal and that's why this concept of duality is most useful okay any question so far no you know my my feeling is uh, and i haven't done much study in this field but my feeling is how many of you have heard of this problem of uber pool how many of you know about uber pool okay maybe some of you have used it in larger cities right so the idea of uber pool is as follows a driver will pick up one passenger then pick up second passenger then pick up third passenger and then it will drop them off in the minimum possible time okay that's the problem so instead of so right now what so uber pool is not available in columbus but what happens right now picks up one passenger drops him off him or her off and then picks up another passenger and drops him or him and her off okay so there's no optimization involved but uber pool is some sort of revolutionary idea okay so what it does is so if you are going to the airport and somebody else from high street is also going to the airport what uber will do is pick you up pick that guy up and then drop you both at the airport and then come back and pick up more passengers okay so somehow your cost is reduced the other person's cost is reduced and the driver is getting more money for maybe increasing the trip time by a couple of minutes okay my feeling is that that's also a problem very similar to traveling salesman problem but i haven't looked at that problem very closely but maybe that's something that they are solving at the back end uh, very efficiently so as to be able to decide whether this drop whether this driver uber pool driver has to pick up another passenger or start dropping off the passenger that it has already picked up okay so 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 there is still there may still be active interest in studying these problems uh, in the context of uber pool and many other newer transportation ideas that are coming up anyways okay so it's important so so here is the problem i want to minimize f of x such that x is in capital x and i have this inequality constraint g of x less than equal to 0 okay and for the time being we'll assume that x is continuous f is continuous g is continuous but later on we'll remove those restrictions and start considering problems of this type okay and let me define f star to be the minimum value and let me also assume that f star is 
finite. It's neither negative infinity nor positive infinity. It is some finite number. Okay. And what I want to do is find this f star. Okay, that's my goal. That, that's what my goal is. I want to find f star. Okay, which so okay, so the goal is find f star. Okay, maybe geometrically or using geometry. So how can we how can we try and solve this problem? So let's do the following. <coughs> this is my g of x. So that's r r. This is my f of x. That's in r. And what I draw is a set S. Looks like a liver. Okay, this is my set S, which is the set of all GX, comma FX for X in capital X. Okay. So what is gx less than equal to 0 on this figure? What part is gx less than equal to 0? So everything here is the set S. Okay, this is the entire set S. So what is gx less than equal to 0? Okay, so this is gx greater than equal to 0. Okay, so gx less than equal to 0 is this side. That's gx less than equal to 0. So what I have to find is minimum of fx in this region. Okay, only in this region. I don't care about what's happening in this region. That's not part of my constraint set. So where is, what is the minimum f in this region? Well, if you look at this point, that is, 0 comma f star right because this is the minimum point for the constraint gx less than equal to 0 okay so that's that's the geometry of the problem okay we want to find so we want to plot the entire set S, which is the tuple gx comma fx for all values of x in the constraint set x. And then what I say is, well, you know the constraint says gx is less than or equal to 0. So all I have to con consider is this part, this part. OK, and if I, con if I concentrate on this part, I realize that this is the point where the value of fx is minimum, right? Because fx is increasing in that direction. So this is the minimum point. And so I project it onto the y-axis, and that's 0 comma f star. And in fact, if you, if you want to look at this problem, that would be g of x star, f of x star, OK? That's this point. The, the, the coordinate along this axis is g of x star, and the coordinate along y-axis is f of x star. And this is, of course, under the assumption that x star exists in this particular problem. Okay. Okay, is this diagram clear to everyone? Okay, we'll, we'll, be, we'll be just concentrating on this particular diagram for the rest of this lecture and maybe next lecture. So now I have the definition of geometric multiplier. So 
so mu star in r r is a geometric multiplier if and only if mu star is greater than equal to 0 and f star is equal to min of x in x l of x mu star Okay, that's the definition of geometric multiplier. Okay, so mu star is said to be a geometric geometric multiplier if mu star is non-negative and f star is the minimum of minimum of Lagrangian. Okay, so let's look at an example. I want to infimize e raised to x such that x is less than equal to zero. Okay, x is in R. So, what's the f star? What is f star here? What's the f star here? Okay, it's a convex problem with convex constraint. Okay, but there is no solution to this problem, right? So f star is equal to 0 because where is that attained? Well, it's attained at x equals minus infinity, but that's not part of the real line. So, so even though the solution doesn't exist, so there is no solution. So the feature is no solution and that would implicate no Lagrange multiplier. Remember, for existence of Lagrange multiplier, you want x star to exist and you want x star to be regular, okay? And here you don't have any solution, so you don't have any Lagrange multiplier. But what I claim is mu star equal to 0, okay? So there is a geometric multiplier in this particular problem. Why? Let's take a look at it. So what is L of x comma mu star that's e raised to x plus 0 multiplied by x that's e raised to x of course i have written minimum here because i'm assuming that a minimum exists but if minimum doesn't exist you have to replace it with infimum so i have f star equals to 0 which is infimum of x in r l of x comma mu star okay so in this case even though lagrange multipliers do not exist geometric multiplier exist and geometric multiplier is equal to 0 in this particular case now, in many papers, you will see that people don't really distinguish between geometric multipliers and Lagrange multipliers. But now onwards, if you write a paper, you better distinguish between geometric multipliers and Lagrange multipliers. They are completely different things. Geometric multipliers comes from the geometry of the problem. Lagrange multipliers, on the other hand, require the solution to exist, the solution to be regular, and some other conditions to be satisfied and only then Lagrange multipliers exist in the problem. It so turns out that for convex problems, the Lagrange multipliers, for some class of convex problems, the Lagrange multipliers, if they exist, will be equivalent to the geometric multipliers. Okay, so they are, for convex problems, they are the same 
but for non convex problems or for general problems they are completely different okay and you should always keep this example in mind okay so now my goal is to try and visualize what this mu is so i want to uh, sort of brush up the 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 theory of hyperplanes okay in uh, uh, in in high dimensional spaces so so let's start with a very simple line in r2 which is a hyperplane in r2 and so line would be something like this and remember what the 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 equation for this line is y equals mx plus c which is the same as saying minus mx plus y equals to c okay and what is uh, m anyone remembers what m is if this is theta what is the value of m tan theta right so m equals tan theta and in this case tan theta is going to be negative so m is going to be negative so minus m is going to be positive right so minus m is is greater than 0 okay what's the normal to this particular line so the normal would be in this direction and the direction of and the vector would be minus m comma 1 or if you want to write it in the vector form you will write it as minus m1 okay and what this line is doing is it's dividing the space in this case r2 into two separate half spaces this is known as so in the direction of the normal it's known as positive half space and this is known as negative half space okay so why do i call it a positive half space let's say i pick a point x 1 y 1 here what is that point going to satisfy so if i look at minus m x 1 plus y 1 minus c then it's going to be greater than equal to 0 in the positive half space if i pick a pick a point x2 comma y2 in the negative half space and i compute minus mx2 plus y2 minus c i will see that it is less than equal to 0 okay that's why it's called negative half space no matter which point you consider in negative half space this criteria will always be satisfied now along this line let's say i consider x3 comma y3 you would notice that minus m x plus y is equal to minus m x 3 plus y 3 okay that equation will be satisfied by the line and these two are equal to c okay so this is all basic stuff from whatever class you might have taken earlier so let's do it in higher dimensional spaces so r r plus cross r so that's my space that i'll be trying to do the same thing in that space yeah that's right it, it does not so in this case this is a convex problem 
There is no Lagrange multiplier, but there is a geometric multiplier. Okay, but in general, uh, let's see. So, so in general, you may not have a Lagrange multiplier in a problem, but you will have geometric multiplier. But in cases where Lagrange multipliers exist, especially in the convex optimization problem, then the Lagrange multipliers will be equal to the geometric multipliers. How did it come up with geometric multipliers? Like how did we, what is we'll get to, we won't really answer that question in this class, but we will get close to the answer. Okay, and the distinction will become specially clear when we talk about integer optimization problems. Okay, so right now we are not doing integer optimization, so. So I'll get to it, okay? That's the normal, I just want to recall. That this is what the normal is, and in the direction of normal you have positive half space, against the direction of normal you have negative half space. Okay, so everyone remembers these things. Now, I'm going to define a half space H in Z comma W in R R cross R such that mu transpose Z plus W equals to C. Okay, so that would so let me get back to this space. So my normal is mu mu here and then one. That's my normal. I still maintain the same positive half space, negative half space. This mu is greater than or equal to zero. Okay, so the line looks something like this. Okay, and this is my hyperplane H. And this is my RR, so that's my Z in RR, and this is my R. W in R. So let's look at the same figure, but with the set S drawn on the figure itself. And I'm going to zoom in, this is my set S, this is my RR, this is my R, and let's say I draw a line like this. Okay, and the normal is mu 1 for some mu greater than equal to 0. So this mu is greater than equal to 0. Okay, so every point within this set S is achieved by some x in x. So let me pick a point here which is gx comma fx. So what's the equation for this line? What's the equation for this line? The equation will be mu transpose z plus w equals mu transpose gx plus fx, which is equal to L of x comma mu.
So when z is equal to 0, so this is my z and this is my w. So when I pick z equals to 0, I get, so what is z equals to 0? z equals to 0 is this line, okay? This w axis, that's z equals to 0. And when z equals to 0, I have w equals L of x comma mu. So this point is L of x comma mu. Okay, and now I want to find inf over all x in x, L of x comma mu. So I want to find in x in x, L x comma mu. How do I, how do I do that? I want to find this point. How do I do that? This is not, mu is not geometric multiplier yet, okay? All I want to, I pick the value of mu, which is non-negative, and I want to find this point in for L x comma mu. How do I do that? So guess what? I can translate this, this line in this direction without changing the normal, okay? So this line also has a normal mu comma one, this line also has a normal mu comma 1 and this line also has a normal mu comma 1, right? Because they are all parallel to each other, even though they don't look uh, in the figure, but they are parallel to each other, okay? Uh, so what is so my question is, what is inf of over all x in x, lx comma mu in this figure? Okay, so this is my original line. I know this is L of x comma mu. And I drawn three parallel lines. Which one will correspond to this particular value? Last one, this one. Okay, because if you look at it, so this is, inf of L x comma mu, where x is in capital X, okay? Why is that? Well, if I draw a line here, okay, it doesn't touch the axis. If you look at this point, this is maybe gx comma fx, for some x, for some x in the original set, capital X, okay? So if you keep, keep the mu comma one constant, if you keep the normal constant, this point, this line is essentially going through this. So it will intersect at L x comma mu. Well, let me write it as x tilde, okay? So this will be, this point will be L x, x tilde comma mu. Okay, and if you make it, if you translate this line a little bit below, it doesn't have any x tilde, okay? There is no x tilde that you can find so that gx tilde, fx tilde will be within the set and also on the hyperplane, okay? So there is no such point. So this point is the only point, this is the last point that this hyperplane touches before it goes out of the set completely, okay? And so this point will intersect at this axis where z is equal to zero, where z is equal to zero, and that will be your inf over all x in x, L of x comma mu, okay? That's this point. Any questions so far? Now, yeah. Yes, yes. What did you say, ISO? ISO what line? ISO quant lines. What are ISO quant lines? Like, if we were interpreting this as like a, like a literal, some sort of problem for how much 
the objective function changes for changing units. Is the if line of the objective? Well, I haven't yet connected it to the objective function, but I have connected it to the uh, the Lagrangian of the problem. So the x and the y or w intercept of these lines are going to be exactly the value of Lagrangian. Yes. Yeah. Okay. But every line will intersect the w axis at a different point, so they'll have different values of Lagrangian. Okay. Okay. So we understand this part. Okay, there is no confusion about this particular diagram. So let me, so that part is already cluttered. So let me draw the same diagram again. And what I want to do is I want to find what F star, where F star is. Where is my F star? So this is my F star, right? This is my zero comma F star. So if I want to find a mu star at which, so if I want to find the geometric multiplier, so what is geometric multiplier? My inf over x in x, L of x comma mu star should be equals to F star, okay? So if I want to find the geometric multiplier, I have to look at this particular line and look at the normal of this line, right? I have to look at the normal of this particular hyperplane. What, what does this hyperplane do? It goes, it passes through the point in the set S at which the minimum is achieved. If at all a minimum exists, otherwise infimum is achieved if the infimum exists. Okay, so that's mu star comma one. And if it is vertical in this, vertical of this sort, then mu star is equal to zero. Now I'll show you another problem where mu star is positive and that looks Okay, that looks something like this. So this is my set S. And if you draw a, a line of this sort, this is the minimum point. This is where F star is. Okay, and this is mu star comma one. This is the hyperplane that keeps S in the positive half space. Okay, so S is completely contained in the positive half space and it intersects at F star okay, intersects at the point at which the optimal is achieved. Okay, so in this case, mu star is equal to zero, geometric multiplier exists and is equal to zero. In this case, mu star is greater than zero, okay, so if it is in, well, yeah, so just, so, okay, so mu star is greater than zero in this particular case. Now, I'll draw another case another figure where there is no mu star whatsoever. Okay, there is no mu star because F star is here. This is my F star. This is the minimum point in the negative, in this negative half space. But if you draw a, a line, if you draw a line that keeps S in the positive half space, it doesn't pass through F star point. Okay, it doesn't pass through the optimal point. So there is no geometric multiplier, no mu star in this case. Okay. So that's basically what, uh, so this is how you cast the original optimization problem 
into a geometric problem where all you have to do is find a hyperplane that supports S. And how does it support S? Well, the entire set S has to be in the positive half space of that particular hyperplane. Okay. So in this case, there are two such hyperplanes. There is one hyperplane that looks like this. It supports the entire set S in the positive half space. There is this other hyperplane okay, that also supports S in the positive half space. But this one passes through the optimal point F star, okay, the point at which the optimal is achieved. That's this point. Okay. So this, the normal to this particular this particular hyperplane is the geometric multiplier, okay, because it passes through F star. This line doesn't pass through F star. Where is F star here? F star is this point. This is my F star point. Okay, this is the point at which the optimal is achieved. And since this hyperplane doesn't pass through F star, this is not a geometric multiplier. Okay? So this is the geometric multiplier. Now I look at this problem. And in this case, it was easy to find a hyperplane that passes through F star point and also supports S in the positive half space. And so the normal to this particular hyperplane is mu star comma one. So this is the geometric multiplier. And in this case, there is absolutely no line whatsoever, no hyperplane whatsoever that will support S, keep it in the positive half space and will also pass through the F star point. Okay? And therefore, there is no geometric multiplier in this particular problem. So that's all I had. Look at this picture. Okay, and then we will prove, we will write everything that we have seen in these pictures rigorously, mathematically, and we'll see what that, what that essentially means from the mathematics viewpoint. And then we'll build the entire theory of duality around this idea okay, that comes from understanding the geometric picture of the constraint set and the objective function. All right, see you guys on Wednesday. Sorry?